It's uh, remarkable that all life on Earth, from ourselves to the smallest bacteria and the greatest tree, are all related. So the very first life to appear on Earth has as its descendants huge numbers of species, all the diversity we see around us, including ourselves. How many is that? Well, to show you, I've brought along a demonstration that I've used at some science fairs before. So this, this is a grain of wheat here in my hand. Just try and show you how small that is. I'm going to use this to represent one species. So this is us, Homo sapiens, one species. So I'll just put that down there for comparison. And now this small bag here, this very small bag, there's about 5,500 grains of wheat in here. And that's one for every species of mammal, approximately. Uh, many of these, incidentally, would be rodents. So, for instance, the friendly leaf-eared mouse is in here, and the destructive pygmy rice rat is in here. And the very fact that we have had to come up with such crazy names in the common language to describe these really shows, actually, just how much even 5,500 species is to come up with names for. So, those are the mammals. The next group I want to show you, you already see where this is going, because there's another sack <laughs> over here. Um, so these are the rest of the vertebrates, not the mammals, but the other vertebrate animals. So that would be birds, reptiles, amphibians, those who walk the amphibian trail, you're represented in here, uh, and also, of course, the fish. And in fact, more than half of these are fish. There's about 56,000 grains of wheat in here, or thereabouts. And I should say these are an approximation, not just because I didn't sit down and count out the but also because, rather embarrassingly in science, it's not only that there are many species out there that we don't know about, it's also that we don't know how many we know about. So there's not a central database or anything where any new species is recorded and everyone knows about it. Even now, even today, in the, the internet age, you would think we would have that, but we don't have it. So there are, there are many attempts to to go through the literature and find out how many species we've got. So this is an approximation, 56,000 species here, vertebrates excluding mammals. I'll just start to put these down in the front there. The next group here, this is just under 5 kilograms of wheat. There's about 100,000 grains in here. This represents the fungi. And this, of course, includes the mushroom-producing fungi, which we would first think of when I say the word fungi. But in addition to that, there will be many microorganisms in here, including yeast. And also the lichens belong to this group, because they are essentially fungi that have formed a special relationship with algae that enables them to get energy from the sun. But they are counted as fungi here, so we've got 100,000 fungi for you. Uh, yes, okay, certainly. I'm going to put some more things on those tables later. But there we have the... Uh, I'll put them in order, so that's in order of how big they are. That's humans, the rest of animals, the rest of vertebrates, uh, all of fungi. And now this group here, these are the plants. So it's going quite a lot now. There's 310,000 grains of wheat in here. That's all the plants. And those, as I said, are just the described ones. So let's put them here now. And the last group I want to show you are the rest of the animals. So these are the invertebrates. So I'll just get this sack. So in this sack I have very many invertebrate animals. So in here I have the sponges, the jellyfish, the, um, the chinoderm, so that's the, the starfish and the sea urchins, mollusks are in here, all kinds of worms and seashells, spiders, scorpions, and I could go on, but actually I've deliberately left one group out of that list. Uh, so I'm going to get those, they're actually, they're separate, uh, they're in another room, so I'm going to bring in the final group to show you that are invertebrates that I didn't just mention. So, one second. This is a bit of a struggle, actually, I wasn't quite expecting it with the microphone on. But, uh, so these are the insects. There's a million grains here, or just under 50 kilograms, about 45 kilograms, uh, a million described species of insect. And this one in my left hand, these are just the beetles on their own. 380,000 beetles and then 620,000 insects. <laughs> one of them. One of them escaped, and actually a few escaped on the ground downstairs. But as I said, it's an approximation, so that's all right. 
Uh, so that's all life on Earth. And each of these grains, that is a leaf on what I like to think of, as many others do, the tree of life. So each species is a leaf, and they're connected. First of all, they connect to twigs, and then branches, and then eventually they all connect to the trunk of the tree, which is the origin of all life. And that was uh, one of the central elements of the book by Richard Dawkins and uh, Yan Wong, The Ancestor's Tale. And it was represented as a pilgrimage from the leaf that represents ourselves, human beings, along our twig and then our branch of the tree, meeting at first our most uh, recent, uh, our closest relatives, and then our more distant relatives, all the way through until we meet everyone. So this is what we all did yesterday on the Ancestors' Trail. We all walked from different starting points to the origin of life. Um, I'm not going to spend too long talking to you about the human trail, which is the focus of this book, but I will just give you a very quick whistle-stop tour of the human trail. Of course, Charles Darwin is our representative human. These are humans, so this is the whistle-stop tour of the ancestors' tale and the ancestors' trail for humans. So, our first rendezvous point, as they call it in the book, is where we meet the chimpanzees, the chimpanzee and the bonobo. Then we meet the gorillas and the orangutans. So now we've met all of the great apes. Next we meet the gibbons, and now we've, we've met all of the apes. Then the old world monkeys join us, and then the new world monkeys. <laughs> so if you walk the new world monkey trail, that's great. So you've joined us now. We are on the seventh Rendezvous points, Tarsiers have just joined us, and then Lemurs join us, so now these are all the primates represented. The ninth rendezvous point is where the Kalugos join us, these are the flying lemurs, and then this says 9b because there's actually a change between the old ancestor's tail and the new ancestor's tail, so the updated book as Steve mentioned, will be out later this year. It will feature this kind of visualisation, this kind of tree of life visualisation, and that will show that there are now extra rendezvous points to be described. So the tree shrews there join us as, the, as essentially the tenth one in reality. Then the next group to join, this is a huge group, this is where all the rodents join us, rabbits and hares, pipers join us here. And then this is another very big group and a very interesting group. Uh, some of you walked the gazelle trail. Is there any gazelle trail people here? Yes, gazelle trail, Steve. So you, you joined us here, uh, but along, along with you came actually most of you were bats, right? When you joined us, most of the lineages of this there were bats. You came from this part of the tree here, uh, from the undulates, those are the hoofed animals, and then embedded within those are, perhaps surprisingly it may seem, the, the whales and dolphins, and then the carnivians as well, so the dogs and the cats and their wild relatives. So that is the 11th rendezvous point. Number 12, armadillos, sloths, anteaters, some of my favourites there, elephants and elephant shrews next, then the marsupials join. And finally, the monotremes. So these are the egg laying mammals, including famously the platypus, but also the echidnas, which look a bit like a hedgehog, but they're nothing like a hedgehog. They, in fact, reproduce by laying eggs, and they have this little beak like a platypus. So now we've met all of the mammals. <coughs> Next, huge group joins birds and reptiles together. Uh, by the way, I'm not mentioning the dinosaurs because I'm only talking here about species that are actually alive today, living species. And the same is, is represented in these, this wheat in front of you. These are living species that we know about in science. And in fact, I, I should have told you that if I was including all the species that we think are out there, but which are not described yet, not known to science, then I would be standing on a mountain of wheat weighing about half a tonne. And even that is only the plants fungi and animals together. Then there's all the uh, microorganisms that aren't represented among those, which could easily double us again. But at that stage, we're not really sure what it means to even be a species. If you're a bacteria, what is a species? It's a bit unclear, really. Okay, so next, lungfish, coelacanths. These together, these are the lobe-finned fish. And then 
some more fish join us, the ray fins and the cartilaginous fishes. So I remember stopping yesterday, there was a time uh, when Steve said we joined the, the, ray, the ray fin fish and then shortly afterwards we joined the cartilaginous fish. So that, that represents here. Next, hagfish and lampreys. And now we're outside of fish, the sea squirts join us, which seems a bit surprising. These are tiny little animals that are, are sessile, they, they stick to rocks in the sea, they live um, all around the world and they filter feed. So they might not seem like they're annexed close relatives join as compared to things we might like to think we're closely related to, like, I don't know, octopuses or, or, or insects might be much cooler than sea squirts, but actually it's the sea squirt. And if you look in the base of a sea squirt, actually it has a tiny beating heart with a pacemaker that is different, but has some common features with our own hearts. Then the lancelets join us, and together this whole group, these are the chordates. So they all have a hardened cord down their back, including us. We have a full spine, of course. Then the echinoderms, the starfish and their relatives. Then the biggest group of all joins, not just the insects, but all of the, most of these three sacs over there. So the insects and many other invertebrates join us at that point. Some other worms join us. Corals and jellyfish join us. Strange thing called the trichoplax joins us all on its own. And then the sponges join us. These are all the animals now. And as we keep going, we have some small microorganisms, which I won't talk about very much. Fungi, and then some other things, including true amoebas. And then uh, plants join us. Yay! Yay! Yay. 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 <laughs> you see some plants over here, so there's a bit of a clue about where I'm going next with this. And then finally, the archaea join us, uh, and then the bacteria join us after that. They're not actually even represented here, uh, because the, the way the bacteria join us, as I said, it's not really clear what a species is if you're a bacteria, and also it's not clear if it's right for that to be a tree or, or just a mess of DNA being exchanged all over the place. So uh, bacteria aren't actually represented uh, here. Right, so... Just that is the <laughs> ancestor's tail, whistle stop tour for you. Of course, uh, some of us walked other trails, and it's, we could, in fact, there are, there are two million different trails we could have walked, and each of those would meet run, their own rendezvous points until they meet with the human trail. And it's with that in mind that I'm going to talk you through a completely new trail. So I want to introduce you to our 300 billionth cousin. 25 billion times removed, or thereabouts. And I didn't just make that up, actually. I, I did my best to work it out. Um, and this is time, common time. And I'm sorry. sorry? I'm saying hello to my cousin. Oh, okay. yes, yes, I'm sure that your cousin. Very pleased to meet you. Um, incidentally, this, this could be a, a, a female or a hermaphrodite's cousin, but it couldn't be a male, because time in the wild has either female or hermaphrodites, but no male plants. Uh, when you uh, sort of rub the leaves together or disturb them, you get this wonderful scent. That's, of course, why we use it in cooking. So it, uh, we might think, of course, this is for our benefit, but wild thyme uh, does this too. And it does it for its own benefit. This is chemical warfare. So it's been shown that when this plant goes in the wild, the chemicals it's producing make it harder for other seedlings to germinate around this plant. So it gets rid of its competitors. Also, the chemicals it produces, the essential oils, they act as a fungicide. So if fungi come and try and attack the plant, then it's a nice fungicide the plant has generated for itself. And then thirdly, and perhaps most extraordinarily, if a herbivore comes along and starts happily munching on this plant, the aroma that will be produced will attract the parasites and enemies of those herbivores, which will come and attack the herbivores and thereby help the plant. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this is our 300 uh, billion cousin, 25 billion times removed. You said hello to, to it, Steve, or to her. Uh, but is there much of a family likeness, do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> um, well, it, it, obviously, there doesn't look like much of a family likeness, but there is actually a family likeness between all of us and this time plant, which I'll put down now. Uh, but to see that, you need to really look closely at the plant. You need to look with a microscope at the individual cells. So if you look at this, this is an animal cell, so we are made up out of these building blocks ourselves, roughly speaking, and this is a plant cell. So you can already see some similarities between them. 
And together, these are called the eukaryotes. So animals, plants, fungi, and some other things, everything I've spoken about, they are all eukaryotes. And they have these features in common. Two things I want to mention in particular, uh, these little parts here, these are the mitochondria. These are really important for energy management inside the cell, amongst other things. And the origin of these is thought to be that they were independent bacteria that went inside another bacteria and somehow managed to survive there together and therefore formed a sort of ongoing symbiosis, the descendants of which are all of these these organisms, uh, that all, all of these multicellular organisms, including all animals, plants, fungi, and some other things. The second really important similarity between them is we both have a nucleus to ourselves. So the nucleus is where most, but not all, of the DNA is stored, the blueprint to build us and to build these other organisms with. And by having a nucleus to store this DNA, it has a great deal more control of which parts of the DNA to switch on and off, and to what extent. So if you think of the blueprint, the DNA, as being a bit like a recipe to make something like a carrot cake, the, the, you can tweak the recipe a bit, you can add a bit more sugar, or a bit less, or some more carrot, so you can do those things, but you can't change it to be a recipe for an apple pie instead. <laughs> so the nucleus enables you to do that tweaking uh, to suit your environment, and that's a big benefit. Bacteria can do much less tweaking than us because they don't have a nucleus inside their cells. But the bacteria do have in common with us, and the time they have the same DNA, the same type of language uh, as, as the blueprint for describing uh, what they are. And this is a very efficient way of storing information, I should say. And uh, to describe how efficient it is, I worked out roughly, again this is an approximation, how much it would weigh if we were to encode all the data that Google stores, so all of Google Maps, Google Earth, all of YouTube, all of our personal data, everything they have stored on their servers across the world. If we encode that in DNA instead of in bits and bytes on hard disks, how much would that weigh if we got all that DNA together and put it all in one place, how much would it weigh? Any ideas? Uh, well, actually, not much more than this, but certainly less than two grains. And also, just to put that in perspective, if we instead got together all the DNA from all the life in all the world, so all the information that we are encoding along with our distant cousins all out there, including the bacteria, then that would weigh 50 billion tonnes. So that, we are nowhere near to storing the kind of information with our technology that life is itself storing and processing all the time around us. So now let's embark on the time trail. So this is time. Uh, so that's one leaf on the tree of plant life, garden time or common time that you see before you. I'm not going to talk through all the rendezvous points because there's actually nearly 70 of them. So I'm just going to stop off at some important ones or some particularly interesting ones. So the first three, really, all that joins us are other species of thyme. And actually, the browns that you may be able to see here, these are woody species, and the greens are herbaceous ones. And the, the grey are ones where we don't know what they are. Probably not because we don't know, but just because the software doesn't know. So then the fourth rendezvous point, that is where oregano joins us. And um, that kind of makes sense, actually, because oregano, it turns out, produces the same kind of chemical thymol, amongst other things, that thyme produces. So it makes sense to me that they are quite closely related. Zoom out a bit more, we get to the seventh uh, rendezvous point. This is where all of the mints join us. There's a lot of different mints here. And now the ninth, this is where rosemary and sage join us. By the way, parsley, that's not going to join us anytime soon, which just shows us how we group things together in ways that when we start to learn how they're really related, doesn't necessarily make sense. And now uh, the next one that I've actually got to show you, this is basil. Basil and lavender join us together at uh, common ancestor number 11. Uh, and this, by the way, this is... Uh, 7.4 million years ago or thereabouts, when time meets the basil and the lavender. So in that amount of time, over on the human trail, we have not yet met the first uh, common ancestor. We have not yet met our rendezvous point with the chimpanzees. 
So it just shows how, although we've done a lot of evolving in that time since, since our ancestors in those seven million years, in another kind of way, uh, the ancestor we're talking about here has produced hundreds of different species of herb in that same time. Rendezvous point 13, head entry joint, which is rather <coughs> strangely named thing. And now we get to rendezvous point 18. This is the whole of the mint and basil family joined. This is 33 million years ago, so this was during the Oligocene, and that was a time when the forests were declining and grasslands were expanding. So it would make sense to me that this group of herbs, of plants that grow in grasslands in the wilds uh, predominantly, would be expanding and diversifying as they were over these 30 million uh, years to produce such a diverse family. I'm going to zoom out now to rendezvous point 22. This is where a rather curious plant joins us. Uh, this is the bladderwort. And I don't know if any of you have seen or heard of this before, but it makes the chemical warfare of the time and its relatives seem quite trivial compared to what this can do. Uh, it looks, looks like nothing. In fact, the flowers probably seem the most interesting part of it. But actually, the most interesting part of it is under the soil. This is the most... Um, advanced, if you like, or certainly the most sophisticated carnivorous plant uh, that I know of. And it actually traps tiny animals inside the waterlogged soil. And there are fully aquatic versions of it which trap aquatic animals. And the traps, you can just see, it's a bit, it's a bit pot bound. So as I pull some of these out of the bottom, you'll see, well, you probably can't see actually, there are tiny little traps about a millimetre along, little pods or bladders. And they have a suction effect. So when things come and touch the trigger hairs, they suck them in. And then a, a trap door shuts behind them and they're trapped. And then the plant pumps water out of the trap to reset the trap so they can then catch a second thing. Uh, so that's much more sophisticated than the Venus flytrap, which I will talk about a little bit later. So uh, this kind of thing, carnivorous plants, they evolve, it's thought, under conditions where the normal things plants are fighting over, like light and, uh, light and, why have I forgotten the second thing that plants normally fight over? Light and water, yes. The normal things that plants fight over, light and water, if those things are just around in copious amounts, and at the same time you are missing nitrogen, phosphorus, other important nutrients that the plant needs to grow, then that enables the plant to do things which are very expensive, in terms of not being able to both synthesize too well or wasting lots of water in order to make up uh, that shortage in nitrogen that they may have. And the plants have come up with all different kinds of ways of doing this, but the carnivorous plants have done it by capturing prey and digesting them in the same way that animals do. So this is the bladderwort, and it joins us alongside the butterwort, which is also carnivorous, but I won't say much about it, so I'll put these over here with you. Um, so that's number 22 on our trail of the time. Okay, now olives and jasmine join us, I won't say much about that. 27, that's where we are now, the Solonades join us, this is rendezvous number 27, and this is an interesting group because inside this group are the, uh, are the group that contains potatoes, aubergines, tomatoes and peppers, including chilli peppers. So many of my favourite foods actually join us. I've got a chilli here. So chilies have been artificially selected by us to suit our own purposes, but in the wild they also do produce a, a hot pepper. And they do this again for their own purposes. It, it's a kind of chemical warfare, like the time, but it has a different purpose. Because what the chilli plant in the wild wants is for its fruit to be spread by a bird and not by a mammal, because the bird is going to take to the air and spread them much further, which benefits the plant. So by producing this chemical, which capsicum, which it causes us pain as mammals, but which the birds don't notice at all, the plant is causing its fruits to be spread by the birds instead of the mammals. But being strange ourselves, we kind of like that pain of having chili in our food. And so, so we have instead artificially selected chilies to be stronger and stronger, much stronger than there would ever be a need for them to, to have in the wild. So in fact, we've, the current record is the Carolina Reaper, 
which is 250 times stronger than the strongest jalapeno pepper. And that's, that's something that we have done through artificial selection rather than through our own technology, rather than by, uh, rather naturally as the, as the wild chili would, would have formed. So I'll just give you the chili plant over there. That is number 27 on the time trail. Right, some other groups join us. Ah, oh, yes, the Borage family joins us. I don't want to say much about them in particular. They include the forget-me-nots, and they include the Chinese hound's tongue, just to give you an amusing uh, named one as well. That's 75 million years ago. So to put this in perspective, uh, our, on the human trail, we have reached number nine. We have reached our, ancestor, our common ancestor with all other primates. This was the late Cretaceous period. But in that time, our group, the primates, has evolved to be about 370 species, whilst this group has evolved into 45,000 different species, as far uh, ranging in terms of their, their diversity as to include these weird carnivorous plants, olive trees, herbs and chilies. So all of that has happened over the same 75 million years. And I think that gives a sense of perspective. What would our own ancestors have looked like at that time? They would probably have been small nocturnal animals with big eyes. And uh, yeah, that's what our ancestors would have been like then. So let's just keep zooming out now. Uh, this is where the uh, holly and the ivy join us. And then heather joins us along with Brazil nuts, tea, kiwi fruit, and this other carnivorous plant. I'm going to talk a lot about carnivorous plants because I think they're interesting evolutionally. So all of these, they join us together at this point. Number 37, the 37th <coughs> rendezvous point, and this is where a large group joins us containing the rest of the carnivorous plants that I wanted to uh, discuss, as well as cacti, sandalwood, and mistletoe, and also knotweed, including the notorious Japanese knotweeds. But since, as I mentioned, I was going to talk about uh, carnivorous plants in particular, I'm just going to zoom in on this group to show you. So there are several different carnivorous plants here, all quite closely related, and there are also some things in here which used to be carnivorous and have, have, have stopped being carnivorous, and there are some in there even which are <coughs> being carnivorous part of the time. Uh, so, I'll talk first about the Asian pitcher plants, the monkey cups as they're called. I've brought one here, they're quite hard to take care of, so I'm not sure how long this one will survive. Um, but I bought it for a few events this year, so, so far it's looking quite healthy. There's a lot of them in Borneo. And they, they are, their mechanism of trapping prey is to attract them to, to this, this is the trap here on the end of the leaf. They attract the prey. And there's a very slippery, waxy uh, lip here. They're attracted by, uh, by nectar or something similar, which, which is, uh, tastes good to the insects. And the insects are happily feeding on that, or other prey potentially. And then it falls down the tube where there is awaiting it some digestive fluid belonging to the plant. So that is the, the trapping mechanism of these monkey cups. And it's a trapping mechanism that has evolved more than once independently. This is what we call convergent evolution. So this one that I brought out already, the uh, North American uh, pitcher plant that Steve's holding up, that has got exactly the same mechanism. But that one is more closely related to tea and kiwi fruits than it is to this. So this is completely independently evolved, the same waxy, slippery rim, the same attractor, the same lid to stop it from getting so full up with rainwater that it just floods out. All the same things evolving more than once. And actually, all the same things have evolved three times, because this one, the Albany picture plant, hasn't joined us yet, but will do in the future. I'm going to give you those to look at. Uh, the other interesting thing about the Asian pitcher plant I, I was just showing you is that this is actually a whole genus, the Penthes. They have diversified themselves into a very large group, and some of them have become vegetarian. So there's, there's one of them, for instance, which mostly is adapted to catch a leaf litter. That's better for the plant because it gets all the goodness in that leaf litter for itself, rather than then going into the ground where it has to fight for it again with the other plants that are around. And there's even one that was discovered recently, which it attracts bats, not as prey, but as a, uh, a partner in, in what would be called co-evolution. So the bat has evolved to 
live inside the trap, what was formerly the trap of one of these plants. So it comes to roost inside a really big trap. And the digestion fluid has, has deliberately been lowered by the plant to a level which won't harm the bat. And then all the guano, all the droppings from the bat, will, the plant will get that for itself instead of having to fight for it. And in return, the plant has given the bat a, a wonderfully safe place for it to roost at night. Even more amazing than that, the plant has evolved to give off a signal. The bat, the bat is, of course, using sonar to catch its prey for the night. And the plant has evolved its traps, its former traps, to give an attractive signal out to the bat, to attract the bat uh, through sonar. So even at night, where the bat can't see anything apart from with its sonar, it can find these plants to go and roost in during the day. Uh, I'm also briefly going to talk to you about this other group here, this uh, that joins along with all these others, and which is related to these Asian picture plants, the, the monkey cups, and uh, that is a group which contains the sun dews and the Venus flytrap. This is, of course, a stereotypical carnivorous plant uh, where the, the traps will close on prey. And the main thing I wanted to say about this is just uh, to raise the point about how it could evolve when, of course, if one of these traps closes quite slowly, uh, go on, I don't normally do it, but I'm going to close one for you, okay? So if I touch a trigger here once, nothing happens, right? That's a backup plan. If I touch it twice, it's closed. And it's closed very quickly. Uh, and it's closed very quickly because if it closes slowly, the insect will just escape. And that's no good for the plants. And in fact, a small insect still can escape, and the plant wants it to, because the plant will not bother digesting a small thing. If the thing is still in there, then it will sense that, and it will clamp down on it and digest it. But if the thing is small and escapes, the plant will reopen quite quickly. So the way that this is evolved, we think, is we get a clue from that when we look at its closest living relatives. Well, actually, I tell a lie, its closest living relative is the water wheel plant which is like an aquatic Venus flytrap that not many people uh, know about. But uh, apart from that, its closest relatives are these sun dews, which are really sticky. So they attract prey by, by being sticky, and the leaves will curl over prey to make it harder for them to escape, and also to be able to digest them quicker. So you can imagine how something that was sticky would curl over for its own benefit, and then it would get a benefit from curling over faster and faster and faster. And eventually it's curling over so fast that the need for it to be sticky disappears. The Venus flytrap actually is slightly sticky still. And one last thing, these tiny tentacles or, or hairs that are sticky, that have little globules of, of sticky, attractive fluid on the end, uh, those are homologous, meaning that, that uh, the ancestor of these two had these kind of hairs that evolved directly into these, the hairs here and directly into the teeth of the traps of the Venus flytrap and into the trigger hair. So that's what we call homology. So who doesn't have some plants to look at yet? Yeah. I'll give you these two. That was number 37. I'm going to zoom on to number 40, and really just because it would be impossible not to comment on rendezvous point number 40, where this huge group joins us, the Super Rosidae, uh, which includes incidentally the oak and the, the beech and the birch. So many of the trees that we were walking under the shade of yesterday have just joined us at this point, uh, along with uh, the pea family. Actually, I've got some here. So I've got uh, some lentils. That's the pea family. They join us here. Walnuts. Figs, grape, vine, and also the Albany picture plant that I mentioned before. So all of these huge number of things have just joined us. Actually, on the Albany picture plant, if we were walking the trail of the Albany picture plant, it would get to 70 million years before it reaches any common ancestors with any other living species. So there's actually something of a mystery about how it's evolved. And there's not much to go by because it's herbaceous, it doesn't really leave fossils or anything, its closest relatives are trees. Uh, but you can actually get a sort of hint because it produces some leaves that are carnivorous and some that are not. And they also produce some that are sort of halfway in between. So that perhaps gives a clue as to what has gone on in the past. Uh, poppies and buttercups join. So now we have, at 140 million years ago, met all of the eudicots. They are so called because when the seed sprouts, it grows two leaves initially, as opposed to one, which would be the case with the monocots. So now we are back at 188 million years ago. 
Uh, this was the Jurassic period, so dinosaurs were <coughs> ruling the earth and pterodactyls ruling the skies. And this, our, our ancestor at that time would have been something small, shrew-like, probably would have hair still, um, and it would have been egg-laying, most likely. Uh, but uh, we have not yet met our ancestor with the birds and reptiles at that time. And this is where the monocots join us, and they are important because this group contains grass, uh, which of course includes many of the uh, food crops that we use, the wheat, oats, rice, also, banana joins us here, ginger joins us here, orchids, bromeliads. I'm going to spin on now to 240 million years ago. This is the common ancestor of all of the flowering plants. And this was an important point in the evolution of plants because most of the plants that we think of, that we know and love, are flowering plants. There are many others, but most of them are flowering plants. And flowers were such a great thing for plants to have because it enabled them to spread their pollen a long way without doing the work themselves. They, plants typically don't move, except for the Venus flytrap over there, some other exceptions. So they can use other things for payment, or sometimes not for payment, to do the moving for them. And so flowers attract initially insects and then later other animals to do the pollination for the plants and enable them to reproduce. So, first flowering plants 240 million years ago. Uh, so, the ancestor of our time at that, at that point would probably have been a small shrub or tree living in the shade of trees that were not flowering. And it's also thought that would have been, again, in a high water environment. Then we reach the common ancestor with all of the seed plants. These are important because seeds have a seed coat which protect them more uh, from, the, from the weather around them and for, from dryness than, for instance, spores, which other plants might have as their way of reproducing. And the group that joins us here are called the gymnosperms, which means naked seeds. So they still have a seed coat, but they don't have a, a further covering, and none of them have a fruit or anything in quite the same way as the, the flowering plants. So that is 350 million years ago, and at that time on the human trail, our ancestors were probably a bit like salamanders, uh, but we were living on land at least, or at least in sort of fresh water and coming out into land at some times. But our ancestors then would have had to return to water to breed at least. This is number 50, our 50th rendezvous point. That is where the ferns join us. This is the last group that actually grows to be uh, of a big size, and they, they reproduce using spores, so they didn't have uh, pollen or seeds in the way that the other plants we've looked at so far had. Uh, this was about 400 million years ago during the Devonian period, so our ancestors over on the human trail, we would have been fish at the time. We're getting near the end now. This is the 51st rendezvous point. This is where spike mosses, various other mosses, and also um, quillworts join us. This is 430 million years ago. And these, this group together, along with everything else I've shown you so far from the plants, they are the vascular plants. And they are important because they have a way to transport water and, nu and nutrients around their plant bodies. They have little vessels that have evolved for that purpose. And they also have a slightly waxy coating that enables them to colonise uh, much drier areas than the other plants that I'm about to show you. However, they were still rather restricted, and particularly when it comes to reproduction, because and not many people know this, uh, all of the, these other plants, they actually have a sperm. And in the case of the mosses and in the ferns, that sperm has to swim unprotected in the natural environment. Uh, in order to fertilise essentially the egg of, of those plants and in order for them to reproduce. So you can imagine how in a really dry environment where there's no water, that sperm isn't going anywhere and they won't be able to reproduce. So they all have uh, that limitation. Whereas these flowering plants, their sperm is protected. It only really swims down a special tube inside the flower. And the pollen is the thing which protects uh, and will eventually produce that, that sperm. 53rd 
common ancestor, most recent common ancestor, the 53rd rendezvous point. This is where the liverworts and the mosses join us. So these are actually the last of the land plants I'll show you. These are the last things that have any hope of living on land. But they still, they still live in quite moist environments. And actually the, the ancestor of, of thyme at this point would have looked a bit more like a liverwort. Although I, I stress that um, this has evolved over just the same period of time and in its own way since its common ancestors it shares with thyme. Very, very simple little uh, uh, thing there, growing in damp conditions. That is the 53rd uh, rendezvous point. On the human trail, we have met, met our 26th rendezvous point. So at that time, we were probably a worm-type creature uh, living in water. And uh, so, well, we were bilaterally symmetric. So the, the left, our ancestors would have looked the same, the left side would be a mirror image of the right side at that time. That is 550 million years ago now. All of the other rendezvous points in the plants, up to number 58, we have just different species of green algae join like this. And uh, so the rest of these trails, all of the trails, both the human one and the time one, are now underwater. And that is an example of the kind of algae that we would have had. So, so actually the ancestor of time at this point would have been an algae a bit like this, but not like this, as I mentioned. 60th rendezvous point, this is where species join us that are not green plants. So everything we've seen so far has been a green plant that has photosynthesized by having a relationship with Chloroplasts, initially separately living bacteria that then became incorporated into the plants, enabling them to photosynthesize, much like the mitochondria became incorporated that I mentioned earlier. So the red algae, this group here, which includes many seaweeds, they have been able to photosynthesize, but by incorporating with a different bacteria. Instead of having what's called a chloroplast, they have a rhodoplast. So those are the red algae joining. 62nd rendezvous point, this is where the brown algae join, and uh, they grow into kelp. So this is yet another example of photosynthesis, but by a different route, without chloroplast. Along with the kelp of the brown algae, the same group joining us at the same time is instantly malaria. Malaria, it's thought, was once a photosynthesizing organism that then became a parasite spread by mosquitoes and plaguing us, amongst other things. But once it was uh, happily photosynthesizing, that was the way it made its life. Also joining us here are the Foraminifera, beautiful little single-celled creatures with calcium carbonate shells, really, really ornate and uh, growing in the sea, all over the sea today. Uh, in fact, if you, if you uh, have chalk, then its origin is probably from Foraminifera. 65 rendezvous point, this is where we join ourselves, the humans and the fungi together, all of them. And then, th so this was approximately, well there's, this, I say very approximately actually because different sources say different things. Uh, I believe in the new book it will say something like 1.4 billion years ago, but another paper says 1.5 billion years ago. I think I believe the book more than that paper. So I'm going to say 1.4 billion years ago, the time has finally met the human trail. And then the final groups to meet us, this is the 68th rendezvous point. This is where the bacteria uh, join us, uh, the archaea, I should say. Um, this is a picture of Yellowstone National Park, where we have extremophile bacteria growing here in a very hot uh, water and a very unpleasant environment where other organisms wouldn't be able to grow. And that's typically the kind of thing which characterises the archaea group, as distinct from the rest of the bacteria, which actually join us later, but in a messy way. So I'm not going to talk about them. That is the last rendezvous point of the time trail. And um, Before I conclude, I just want to, to tell you that the visualisation that I have been using for much of this talk is called uh, OneZoom, and you can see it yourself at onezoom.org. You can also download for free, if you have an Android phone, the OneZoom app. And during the question session or afterwards, for anyone that's interested, I will get a version of it for plants and for tetrapods up on this little touch screen here, for people to play with. Uh, so my vision for the future of this is to create what I would call the Google Earth of biology. So 
all life on Earth, all of these two million species, with images of them, with information about them, and all the information about how every one evolved from every other one, all online in one place where people can just easily zoom into the area they're interested in and see further information. Uh, there's also, and this is the last bit of advertising I'm going to um, subject you to, another website that recently uh, I created along with the people that I work with on one Zoom, and that is called Zoom Pass. This is where you can build your own family tree of your more close relatives, or see the family trees of famous and fictional characters like we've got the royal family here, and you can go and explore those and then build your own and share it with your family. So that's another little project we've got going, based around the same idea of, of zooming in and out like a map, but to visualise big data. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, many people, including you, for coming along, and I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you.